Hello, good afternoon, LinkedIn. Oh my God, I just realized that I did not fix my background and you can see I'm in my daughter's room so you can see her giant dinosaur in the back. I usually, when I do recordings um, or lives from this room, I tilt the screen um, and this time I completely did not realize that all that just made an appearance in the back. Oh well, those are the times and I think we've all had those you know, awkward moments in one way or another. Um, let's talk about today's interview. I am so excited, but I'm also a little bit intimidated. Um, you know, some of you know that I've done a bit of public speaking myself, and I'm saying a bit, I'm playing it down, but I've done quite a bit now. Um, and I've always found it to be extremely intimidating. And no surprise, I mean, it is the number one fear that people have, right? You might've seen in the um, post I shared about today's interview, like, bigger fear than the fear of death, like bigger fear than the fear of COVID right now, bigger fear than, I don't know, fear of spiders or enclosed spaces, fear of heights, like fear of public speaking. It is so intimidating and it's something that I've been working on for quite a while and I still get incredibly nervous, incredibly in my head. Um, it's not the most, you know, comfortable. It's just you, you're exposing yourself. And, you know, it did happen to me at the beginning of my, I was going to say public speaking career, but I don't have one yet. But when I first ventured into public speaking, I mean, I did have somebody tell me that I was pretty shit and to like maybe not do that again. Um, but he turned around, he heard me speak a year and a half later and thought that I was great. So it's all work in progress. But that being said, today I'm interviewing somebody who's a phenomenal public speaker. So that's intimidating, but exciting because we get to learn. Today I'm interviewing Ryan Avery. He was the youngest winner worldwide of Toastmasters. That's pretty cool, the youngest. And that was a few years ago, I believe 2012. You'll correct me if I made a mistake. Um, so eight years ago, but nobody has beaten that record yet. So he's still the record holder, again, from the research I've done. Um, how I came across Ryan's work uh, was I was at a global leadership conference in Germany, in Frankfurt. And I was a judge of Global Student Entrepreneur Awards that year. And as we were judging, the way that um, that was structured was that we had 10 minute breaks where judges would focus on scoring the competitors and the audience would have the honor and the pleasure of listening to some world class speakers come on stage and just do a 10 minute talk, which was just a quick preview. And then um, a couple of days later at the Global Leadership Conference, you could attend the full uh, version of their talk. And so I was missing out on everybody's little mini talk because I was scoring, right? I was in the papers, making calculations, calculator, doing all that. And then Ryan came on stage and he, I don't know if it was his presence, how he was speaking, there was something. I scored nothing and I just like listened. And then when he got off stage and then we're like, okay, the next competitor, next contestant is up. I was like, uh oh, <laughs> I scored nothing. Um, so he was that compelling. And then since then I've followed his work. I had a few fellow entrepreneurs, members of entrepreneurs organizations speak so highly about Ryan um, because he's given talks all over the world um, to um, some of our chapters. He's given over 500 keynotes in over 30 countries. I think you also mentioned the continents on his bio. So it was super cool, intimidating, inspired me to keep going with my public speaking. Um, and so stop listening to me talk. I'm introducing you to my guest today. Ryan, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I, was, uh, I didn't know that story. I hope the, the contestant was, did okay still with your judging. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> but I remember you. <laughs> so maybe the contestant could also work, uh, continue working on the pitch and the presentation. Um, okay, I'm gonna like jump right in and ask you a question about public speaking. But then we're gonna rewind because I've stalked you quite a bit online and I learned a lot about your yeah. talks and um, some something about you on a personal level. But I want to know more, like, I want to really rewind. Like, yeah. how did you grow up with this, you know, ability to speak publicly? How did that all get started? 
started? Were yeah. you like three years old and you know debating with your parents? I want to know, but we'll get to that. Okay. First question, okay, because this is just like completely coming from a selfish standpoint. Okay. Yeah. I want to know, in order to be a successful public speaker, do you have to be funny? And the reason I'm asking that is your talk that won um, global Toastmasters uh, competition, trust is a must. Yeah. Like you were really funny. And then I was reading how like somebody did a whole analysis and breakdown of why you won. And they were counting how many times people laughed and like how frequent and things like that. Yeah. And I'm not funny. Yeah. So I just want to know, is that a must? So a few things. There's uh, a saying within our industry um, that uh, you don't have to be funny unless you want to be booked again. Um, so that is a thing to consider. Um, but a few things with humor. First off, um, it has to be authentic. Um, I'm not funny either. Like if you ask any of my friends or if you ask my wife, I am like the least funniest person in within our family. However, I strategically know how to, while I'm on stage or communicating with people, how to inject humor into it to get my point across. Um, there's a lot of different reasons why you wanna use humor as well. Um, there's been research that shows that when you make people laugh, it also releases a hormone that allows you to remember. So humor is attached to memory. So that's really important when we're speaking. So the more you're making people laugh, the better you are at making people remember. And we can think of that with comedians, right? Some of our favorite comedians, we can still remember some of their favorite lines that make us feel good because of what they said. Um, the other thing that I do is, so I never share a joke. Like I will never tell a joke. I will never do any of that on stage. All I do is I share my failures, stories about my family or stories about my fears. And that inevitably leads to making people laugh because you know it's the Brene Brown type of feeling of being vulnerable and sharing your fears, your family or your failures um, are golden stories to make people laugh. So that's how I did it. And yes, you need to be funny and you want to be booked again. Okay. okay. <laughs> but you know, I like that um, the way that you, that you found your own angle and way of being funny. And for you, it is storytelling, which I know also is the cornerstone um, of, you know, what you tell people, you know, an effective public speaker does. Um, but so, but I'm curious to know though, like you also, yes. Okay. I know what you mean because I listened to trust is a must and it was the funny parts were the stories, but it's also how you were delivering them. And you mm. at, ended that talk. Um, with emotion like I, I felt your emotion was so raw and so real I, I felt that you were about to tear, tear up so my question is because you're talking about authenticity mm -hmm. if you're telling stories like how do you tell them in a way and especially if it's the same stories you're telling over and over again yeah. like how can you recreate those emotions of yeah. you know humor or vulnerability or just like the pure emotion so there's six basic emotions that we want to portray whenever we're speaking. And they're the six basic human emotions of happy, sad, fear, anger, surprise, and disgust. And those you want to get across. The way that we do that, the way that I do it, is most public speakers, what they'll do is they will retell their story. One of Some of the best speakers, what they do is they relive their story. So what they do is they don't talk in past tense and they don't use the word was, they get rid of was all together. So for example, um, saying something along the lines of like, hey, uh, last year I was in Antarctica and I was freezing and I was looking at these penguins. What I would do is I would share the story of, I'm in Antarctica, I am freezing. Penguins are looking at me like pigeons in a park. So I relive it. And what that does is it creates an emotional overlay that you yourself are reliving it as well. So your physiology changes and you relive all those emotions and feelings. So instead of retelling, you want to relive your stories and not use the word was and bring it to present. Uh, you know what? And that just, I'm just having flashbacks of some of the best talks I've ever listened to. And it's so true. You could feel that the person, even almost the eye contact was not quite there because they were reliving the experience. And I suppose that that makes it also feel so much more vulnerable. Mm. Well, I mean, vulnerable and connected, right? When I, when I relive a story, ultimately it's my story and you don't care about my story. However, when I relive it, it now becomes your and I's story. And so now you're part of it and you're feeling what I'm feeling. I have shared 
the same stories thousands of times, but it feels like the first time because every time I'm reliving it and I'm reliving those fears, family or failure stories, and I can feel how I felt when I was experiencing it. That is fascinating. And you know, that kind of answers my, my next question because I wanted to know, um, well, it answers the follow-up to the question, but I wanted to know, do you rehearse your talks, like really verbatim rehearse? Yeah, so there's a difference between um, rehearsing and practicing, right? Um, there's a, and reviewing. Um, most leaders that I work with, they review their talks or their presentations. They don't rehearse or practice, right? If an athlete goes out on the field and all they've done is reviewed, but they haven't practiced or rehearsed, are they going to be a good athlete? No, they're not. And it's the same for leaders. Um, they'll say, oh, yeah, I practice in the shower. I practice on the way home in my car. Or I practice. That's not practicing. That's reviewing. How you practice is how you will play. So without a doubt, 100% of the time, I will never put out new material, especially to a paying client, without first practicing it. And I've set up different um, things in my life where I have different groups that I present it to. I have, um, I'll have i typically do one or two trial runs with um, groups that I'll say, hey, look, I have new content. Uh, I'm developing this new keynote. I'm completely free to attend. Uh, it'll be in Denver at 12 o'clock. Here it is, no coming that I'm testing this content out. And then what I do is I pass out note cards um, and then I'll say, what was the message? I'll say, what was um, things that you liked and what were things that you didn't like? And then ultimately, whenever I, I'll do, sometimes I've done even three because ultimately what you want, what I want is on that note card, I want every single person writing down the same, what was the message? And if they didn't, I'm not, I'm not doing my job then, right? I need everyone to say trust is a must. I need everyone to say go from A to B. I need everyone to say motivate millennials. Like I need that consistency. And then it's really good feedback because they'll go, hey, you weren't funny right here. Or hey, this would actually been a great, uh, I like for sometimes when I tell stories, I don't think people really care about a certain part of me reliving it. But then I'll get feedback of like, oh, man, I wish you went deeper into that story. And I was like, oh, OK, well, if you wanted me to go deeper and they give me that insight. So how you practice is how you will play. Rehearse. Yes. Um, you know how like if you're going to speak in front of 100 people, set up 100 empty chairs. I've spoken to several empty hotel room like ballrooms before to practice. I've hired out boardrooms because I've spoken to boardrooms, um, all different types of practice. Definitely. I never thought about that. Like every single thing you're saying, I hadn't thought of, and it's all for me to rewatch and then take notes. That is so interesting. And I really find the idea um, of, I mean, that's just also really like high integrity because I know that organizations and events pay you a lot of money for you to speak, right? Like you um, obviously are, you know, a world class speaker. Um, so for you to create. I want to, I want to not cut you off, but I want to um, uh, demystify like this myth. Companies don't pay me a lot of money to speak. They pay me a lot of money for my strategies. And that was a really important lesson that I had to learn early on in speaking. I was like, oh, people are paying for me. Like what an ego thing, right? Like no, no one cares about Ryan Avery. They don't care about me. What they ultimately want and why they pay me that check is to say, you made my team better because of the strategies I haven't heard before that they now can implement. So the better strategies, the newer strategies, the simpler strategies, the, the strategies that people go, wow, that's when your price goes up. That's when people go, mm, I want to refer Ryan Avery. So looking for people who are watching this or for people who are thinking about being a speaker, they are not paying for you. They are paying for your strategies. Okay, we're about to go into childhood because I just want to know that lack of ego though, because yes, most people will do feel they're paying for me. And especially when they get the you win this like really high prestigious competition, yeah. you're the youngest, um, you start getting booked all over the world. I remember when we spoke last time, you told me that you were traveling, last year you traveled how many days out of the year? 
I usually travel 200 days a year. This year, a little different. <laughs> COVID makes it a little. Why? A little uh, but so <laughs> incredible. So you get booked to, to go to so many places, and like that's like you right, and then the feedback that you're getting, I know that can really you know build up an ego. Right. So how come you ha you are preserving such you know like a cool you know head, and you understand it's all about the outcome. You continue even though you have this massive public speaking experience now. You continue to book places speak for free make sure your material is worth charging for like is that from childhood that like mom do a really good job or where does that come from um i really feel like it comes from my research so for the past five years i've dedicated my life to understanding the difference of what it means to be a versus what it means to be the at something and when i study these global thought leaders when i interview these world leaders when i do research and do surveys it it's completely apparent that A, you are something different than B. Like why, why does Michael Phelps win? Like why is Oprah at the top of her game? Like there's nothing different between us. We're humans, we have the same opportunities. If you have connection to the internet and you have 30 bucks a month, like you can, you could change the world. So why isn't everyone doing that? Why are so many people A and why, what makes that person B? And there's so many things, um, but it's continual growth. It's continuous. Like for me, it is my biggest thing is continuously battling my ego. Um, for so long, I believed accomplishment was connected to my self-worth and I felt like, you know, if you've ever had this feeling of, I would, I would break these world records and I would feel empty inside. And I would say, oh, I got to break two more world records and then sick. And you, all of a sudden you're like, what are you even doing this for? Um, so this ego for me is something that I have to constantly battle. And I learned that from people who are the in their life. And that could be the parent, that could be um, the, you know, when you're at Disney World and you see the janitor who's sweeping but also dips his mop into the water and makes a Mickey Mouse with the thing, like you see these little things that people are doing to be V in their everyday life and you realize like they're learning, they're changing, they're constantly um, receiving feedback. Um, so for me, it was a combination of probably my upbringing, but I would say a big chunk of it is the insight from the research that has come from these interviews and studying and then my personal practice. Like I can't tell you how many bridges I've burned because of my ego that I'll never have enough resources to build back. Um, and you learn firsthand experience like, well, I probably shouldn't do that again. That sucks. <laughs> you know, like you, you learn and um, you learn. Could you give me an example since you are comfortable sharing failures, a bridge you burned and what happened? How Man, I mean, what did you do? So many, so many ones that come to mind. One, um, this one's like so embarrassing. Okay, so um, I am, this is like, I'm like really doing well in public speaking. Like one year after I win, I'm like all over the world. I'm traveling, I'm making like five times the amount that I was at where I used to work. And I was like, what, this is amazing. And uh, I won't name the, um, the company, but it was a really big company. It was a very big hotel chain in Las Vegas. And they um, heard about me, one of their executives had heard about me speak at, uh, they had heard me speak at an event and he, they were like, Ryan is perfect. They're, they're creating this new mentorship program for their emerging executives and they wanted me to take that over. And so they wanted me to test and see how I did. So they hire me, they take me out to the fancy ho like the fancy uh, hotel when like they book me up in this suite. Like it's, it's like unbelievable. So I go, I do, uh, all the executives are there. I knock it out of the park. It's like so awesome. They take me to this private bar that only executives can access. Like it's like this un untapped world to Vegas. And we're all sitting around, I'm like drinking my martini and we're all like in this semicircle. And uh, one of the guys goes like, hey, what what do you think? Like, do you like our energy? Like, do you think you could you know, work with us? And I was like, absolutely amazing. I love it. I, um, I just wish that I could have met John. And everyone goes, what do you mean? And they're like, oh, I wish I could have met John, the guy who hired me. And the guy looks at me and he goes, I'm John. And I was like, 
Oh, uh, yeah. uh, and like the energy, like it was just like, oh, it like melted away. And it was just so, it was so devastating. Like the energy was weird. Like people were like, so this guy's just been fake the whole time. Like he's just been like, who is this guy even? I didn't get the contract. It was awful. And I was so caught up in like, oh my gosh, I'm in a fancy hotel. Oh yeah, I deserve a limo. Like, oh yeah, this is awesome. <laughs> Versus like who I am. I'm this guy from Humble, Texas who like knows people's names. And I lost that. And it was uh, it's uh it's a really, really crappy story to talk about. Um but that's one example of stupid things that I've done that I'll never go and speak to that uh, casino again. So yeah. Yay. <laughs> thank you for sharing that. And thank you for sharing, you know, authentically that it was completely because of you being overtaken by the glamour and the ego and feel it. I've made it. I can say whatever and I don't need to, you know, um, that's really cool. OK, but so I, I do want to know about, you know, how it all started. I want to know whether you were always the one to, I don't know, stand on a little stool and recite poetry at family dinners or uh, when did the um, this desire to speak, up, speak yeah. up when did that start so um it hasn't always been that way i'll i'll tell you the shorter version in the sense of how my public speaking career started so i'm like really fascinated with olympians like i love gabby douglas i love michael phelps like i'm fascinated by these people who dedicate their lives to something and become the best at it and this is like years ago before i knew what v was right and, oh pardon me um, before i knew what v was and so it's 2012 it's january of 2012 and i'm following these olympians and i'm like i'm never gonna be an olympian like that kind of sucks. Like I want to be an Olympian. I want to be the best at something. And my best friend at the time, he takes me to uh, lunch and he's like, he had recently quit his job um, to pursue his dream of filmmaking. And the film lost a lot of money and he's not getting a produce. And he's, he's like, Ryan, they lied to you. Like, don't, don't go after your dreams. Like play it safe. Like it sucks. And I'm like, oh man, that really, that sucks. And he's like, what is the hardest thing you've ever had to do? And I was like, uh, I don't know. And it made me, it makes, at that time, it makes me feel really crappy as a human. Like I'm 24, I've really done nothing with my life. It's been pretty easy. I've like done the college thing. It felt so simple. And I was like, man, that really sucks. So I go through this little like deep, like pity, like, oh, poor me. And I'm like watching a bunch of YouTube videos because that's what I used to do to, <laughs> to get through things. And, um, this video comes across where this person is going for the world championship of public speaking. Never heard about it before. And I remember, like you said at the beginning of your intro, people say that public speaking is the hardest thing or people are afraid of public speaking more than anything. So I say, fine, I'll do that. I will win that competition. I will be the best at that. And eight months later I win. And uh, the short version is that I win. Um, and then what really happens is, so I get these invitations to help people learn more about public speaking, but it's not about public speaking. It's about how do you, how do you commit to going from nothing to something? How do you, how do you decide to be the best at something? And you've got to have, it's not you. It's not you. All you have to do is you have to show up and make the decision. What makes you be are the people you surround yourself with, the knowledge that you take in, um, the mentors that you have. So I call them the three C's. Um, you have to have these three C's in your corner. You have to have the cheerleader, you have to have the coach, and you have to have the champion. Those are all three very different people. So the cheerleader is the person who reminds you on a regular basis of why you started in the first place. They're the ones who are like, you got this, you can do this, keep it up. The coach is the person who holds you accountable for the things that you said you were going to do. And the champion is the person who has already been where you want to go, who gives you the insight of how to get there. And what most leaders do is they confuse the coach with the champion. They believe they hire a coach to show them how to get there. That is not what the coach does. The coach holds you accountable 
to get to where you want to go based off of what the champion has shared. So what I ultimately learned is I had the cheerleader, the coach and the champion in my corner. And I was the athlete at the time of speaking. And it helped me realize a lot of those things. So that's really how it started. Um, it started back in early 2012. Um, I realized that um, public, you, you know, people call it public speaking. I really ultimately found out that teaching is my passion. I love to teach my method is speaking that's how i i deliver it uh, it's what i've found to study and now i do it so for me it's um teaching is really what i love that's very cool but nonetheless okay so do you then believe that anybody can go from being a to being the like anybody yeah definitely 100 percent. i believe that i know yeah. that but you don't think that you have to so for example somebody wants to become a world-class public speaker let's say or maybe a, like a teacher sure. like you you know that's okay. the wrong approach that because that's just the like method that's just the vehicle no no, no. you're saying hey like if you want to be a world-class speaker everyone can be a world-class speaker everyone can be me though too like you've got to um sorry go ahead what's what's your example Tell no, me but, okay that. but i'm wondering like but don't you need okay so first of all you know but there are some innate qualities i think you have to have like you have to have the charisma you can develop that maybe you'll tell me you can you have to be eloquent like you have to be well spoken like if somebody's like oh, 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 and they can't be so right. like you can really become the, the at that as well but you're saying all things that are learnable eloquent mm -hmm. is a learnable skill um, charisma is a learnable skill. Um, these are all learnable things, which all equate to being me. But how can charisma be learned? You don't think we're, we're born with that and some people have it and some people just are a bit more awkward and don't? Yeah, I mean, you can still be born with it. That doesn't mean that people who aren't born with it can't obtain it. You know, like I wasn't born with wealth, but I can make money. Like I wasn't born with um good hair but i mean you know I'm just, I'm just um you, you can you can the people who aren't born with it can still have it i think that like that's a that's a are, are leaders born or are they made who cares if you're born take it if or do you want to make it like i don't necessarily believe i was born a leader but i do believe there are leaders who are born um yeah i, I there's there's a uh a thing that we need to get rid of on that of like who cares if it's born or if it's made like of course you can make and understand what charisma is you can learn there's books on charisma there are videos on charisma like if you're truly interested in being more charismatic you can learn that that's a learnable skill that's cool see i know i told you before a talk this is going to be tangible but also quite inspiring and you have that you know you you do bring that in your in your talks on how you communicate which is really cool and you know what right now we need some inspiration and some positive vibes in their lives so this also comes at a good time so you were going to say something um one of the things that i i do on all my interviews and really even in my videos is i still i carry a notebook with me and i i haven't I haven't uh, come up with the the concept of born versus made yet, but it's an idea that once we talked about, I liked. So don't be afraid to like have notes or like take notes or when you have an inspiring idea, write them down because I want to do more research on that. And I want to explain like, who cares if you're born with it or you made it? Like I want to dive deeper into that. So for me, it's a an, an idea that you can take or anyone can take of like, don't be afraid to have a notebook, even at a dinner table with you. Mm -hmm. You know what, and that topic definitely merits a lot more, you know, research and some, you know, takeaways from it. So if that's something that you develop further, um, I think it's interesting because you hear a lot, um, are leaders born or made or, and are entrepreneurs born or made, right? Those are two, they're asked all the time, always. And when you just said, who cares? I was like, oh, who cares? But we do talk about it all the time as though if you're not born with it, it's just like you, you're out of My wife and I are prime examples of it. I My wife is like stereotypical nine to five, like, You froze a bit, Ryan. I don't know if you can still hear me. Not, not an ounce. You hear me? Yes, you're just freezing and breaking up a bit. But keep talking, I'll tell you if I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. 
Okay. Um, so my wife and I are like stereotypical different entrepreneurs. I'm I might be more I might be more of a born entrepreneur. She is like nine to five. Not however, we are now both entrepreneurs. She had to make herself learn those skills. They come a little more naturally to me. I I I've been selling candy. Uh, you know, I used to take like stuff from my friend's uh, a pantry and sell it on the street during the summertime to make a couple extra bucks. Like I, that might be a little stealing, um, <laughs> but uh, that it doesn't matter. We're both entrepreneurs. It doesn't matter if I was born and she was made. What matters is we decided to be entrepreneurs. That's what matters. The question should be, did you decide or did you not decide? Are you are you being an entrepreneur? Or are you thinking about being an entrepreneur? That's the difference. Very interesting. Um, what about your, so I also noticed that your talks, you were extremely expressive. Um, it's, 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 it's a bit of a performance, right? It's your body language, you're in it, you're like acting things out. Um, is that, were you born with that or did you take drama classes? Do you recommend it? Did you take any theater? Yeah, um, I have done anything and everything I can to increase my ability to be the, the public speaker. I've taken improv classes to learn how to deal with people who ask me random questions. Um, I have uh, entered like moth competitions and um, Toastmaster, like all the different ways that I can think of, of how uh, I've studied poetry, I've studied uh, like slam poets, all and everything I can to be the, to, to make me, me. Um, I believe I heard it from Wilson. Who did I hear that from? I heard it from someone, sorry that I forgot. But um, he was saying, it takes a long time to learn how to be you. And I really found that to be true because like the first five years, like I would wear a sports coat and I would wear slacks. Like I'm wearing jeans right now because I'm from Texas. Like that's, this is who I am. Right? So whether I'm on a video or I'm on stage or you're at a bar with me um, and we're drinking, like this is who I am. I'm going to talk with my hands. I am going to drink a martini, not a beer. <laughs> I'm going to wear jeans and not a slack. So there's this like, there's, I feel like there's this other misconception about when you get into the speaking industry that you have to be this persona or this somebody else. No, you've got to be you uh, because you're going to be a lot happier when you're you and you're going to attract the clients who like you, right? Um, I, I'm not for everyone. I'm a young 32-year-old kid almost. And not everyone in the corporate corporate world likes this. They want the older, they want the more experienced, but people hire me because they want the young, they want the new perspective, they want the refreshing, they want the guy who has weird mannerisms and you're like, he's kind of feminine, kind of masculine, what is this persona like? That's what they want and I am me. I love that. And then two follow-up questions I have on that. One, well, that's predicated on really deep self-awareness, okay. right? You have to know what, who you are, right? So um, that didn't. That took me until I would say about I was twenty-eight or twenty-nine till I really felt okay with being like, I'm good. I still battle with it sometimes. Like, there's still occasions when. You know, I'll, I'll have a slam dunk of an event because I spent all my time and energy and research on it. And I gave my every last drop of energy and, you know, 900 people in the audience said they loved it. And then five people were like, who's that kid? Why did you hire him? And I'm like, oh, you know, but I'm still learning how to get over that. But for the most part, I would say up until age like 28, I was so focused on what other people thought of me and did things for them versus being like, this is me. Like, I know the value I bring. I know that I can teach you things. I know my content is solid enough to make it where when you do decide to use my content, it will change your life. So that that takes a while. And it's not based off of age. It's based off of experience. And experience is not based off of years. It is based off of time put into it. So, you know, people think sometimes like, you need 20 years of experience. No, you need 20 years worth of experience. Very different. 
Oh, okay. Fascinating. You're giving me really so much food for thought. And, um, you know, the concept of just accepting who you are and being really comfortable with it and understanding that that will maybe alienate some of the audience or prospects, but that's okay because that mm -hmm. will make you much more accepted by others, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because I've had, you know, similar experiences too. You know, there was there were two events that I spoke at and uh, I received quite um you know intense criticism because i was wearing a toque um mm -hmm. because in the winter i wear the toque a lot i feel yeah. chill and casual and cool um but i still wear heels and i dress up but i wear a toque and some people really took uh you know took, took offense to that and said you know loved my content but just still thought it was necessary to mention how i looked um oh. yeah and sometimes that's, it's hard that's, to that's why this job is so hard is you are constantly judged Every time you're just like it's, it's you walk in, you're judged. You leave, you're judged. How you everything is judged. And even if they're not speakers, and uh, they love to pick and they love to prod. But what I'm really learning and what I recommend for everyone to read is I love Ryan Holiday. He's one of my favorite authors. Um, Ego is the Enemy is a really good one. Um, I also love The Four Agreements. I reread that one recently uh, last week, maybe two weeks ago. And it's really important. What I'm learning now is not to, it's the same. What I was doing is, is as much as I was listening and t um, taking in the bad, I was taking in the good. And the being like, oh yeah, I am that way versus being like, I know who I am. You can tell me I'm great. You can tell me I'm bad. Your perspective of who I am doesn't need to change who I am. And I did the opposite. I would I would go towards the positive energy because that's what I was attracted to. And I would try to like let go of the negative instead of staying in the middle to say like, no, who is Ryan Avery? Who Who is, no matter what somebody says to me, I know who I am. And that's an important thing to to learn and grasp. Well, it takes a lot of self confidence, also, and um, I'm working on that um, myself. And also, it takes that ability, as you said, to focus your you know energy and shift on. Yeah. Because you know, I could have an event where it's all positive feedback, but then one person will say something about me wearing sneakers or something. I'll just fixate on that. Yeah. I'm not sure. So it just takes that ability to know yourself, be okay with it, and refocus. And it's really nice for those of us who have kids, right? Because for me, what kids have done for me has allowed me to realize that I want them to see me as me, and I want them to see me fail. I want them to see me mess up. I want them to see me get booed and still the next day show up. Like I, I attempted three world records in three months, uh, three months ago and I broke two and I failed pretty hard at one. What and, were they? Um, so we broke the world record for, um, the largest sock, uh, drive in eight hours. Um, homelessness is a big problem here in my state of Colorado. And so we wanted to collect 10,000 pairs of socks for the 10,000 homeless people who were in Colorado. Uh, the community came together and we broke it by 37,000 pairs of socks, which is pretty wild. Um, wow. We um, we broke the world record. I broke the world record for the longest uh, cycling class in history. We biked for 28 hours to, ride, uh, to raise awareness for people for bikes, um, bike safety. Um, more people are dying by bikes last year um, than any other year. And so we wanted to raise awareness for that. And then the third one that I didn't um, break, but it was pretty epic and pretty, um, it was like a, it was like a, it was like, uh, I won, but I didn't, we raised a lot of money, we raised like a hundred grand, but we didn't break the world record for the largest image made out of house. Um, we did that now in Australia and my daughter got to be a part of it and she got to see that I didn't accomplish it. And she is looking to me, I'm like, how is he going to respond to this? You know, like he's on camera. He is, there are a thousand people waiting to hear the results and Ryan has to deliver it. And there are, there's so many things there that I want my kids to see me fail and then get back up and say, I'm going to go break another one. And I'm going to break a lot more for a lot more people. Um, the, the kid, having kids is like a, a nice way to be self-aware for me. Very true. Absolutely relate to that. You know, I mentioned uh, briefly before that at the beginning when I was doing the introduction, um, 
at the beginning of my, you know, public speaking attempts, I got really bad criticism from somebody. Like I got an email and it just destroyed me for a week. I couldn't get over it. Like pretty much it was like not in such direct words, but like really not good, really bad, no takeaways. Like no takeaways. Like it's not like, you know, you should work on your like deliver or whatever, no takeaways. And like pretty much suggested that I should never do it again, right? Yeah. And then a year and a half later, walk into the place, the person's there again. I freak out. I go to the bathroom. I'm like washing my hands in like ice cold water because I'm like having, you know, hot sweat. Yeah. Yeah. Go deliver. He comes up. He's like, What happened to you? This was unbelievable. This is incredible, right? Yeah. So it was quite transformative. And then I had my daughter who was playing soccer and was told by an older boy, You shouldn't play. You're really bad at it. So you should get out. And so I'm driving to school. She says, I'm quitting soccer. And I tell her, You know what? Let me tell you a story. And I told her that story. She yeah. stayed in soccer, played oh. another game a few weeks later. She scored the, the only goal that her team scored. Oh. And I was like, oh, oh, you remember. So yeah. yeah, I definitely see that learning through them and that value. But yeah. also, as I was saying, it does also beget a lot of confidence and a lot of self-confidence. And I know that you said in one of your talks that confidence creates competence. Yes. What does that mean? So... Confidence creates competence. It doesn't keep confidence. That's a really important aspect of it. Um, so what it does is, and it can be flipped, right? Competence creates confidence as well. But what it ultimately does is, the difference between A leader and B leader is A leader has confidence, B leader demonstrates confidence. Really big difference. I know a lot of leaders who have it, but they do not know how to demonstrate it. They think it is, but it is overpowering or it is egotistical or arrogant or it can come across as not confident. So because you have something doesn't mean you know how to use it. You can have a jet, but that doesn't mean you know how to fly the jet, mm -hmm. right? Like you've got to know the skills in order to be able to have it. Um, so the, the concept there is when you have confidence um, and you can demonstrate it, it's because you know you're competent in that area. You know that you can add value in it. So here's, a, here's something really important that has helped me out a lot. Know the difference between an opinion and feedback. Okay? A leader listens to opinions, B leader listens to feedback. I listen to 0% of people's opinions about me, zero. And I can say that confidently. I listen to 100% of people's feedback about me. And here's the difference. Yeah, here's the difference. An opinion is simply an observation without a how or a why attached to it. Feedback is an observation with a how and a why attached to it. So if someone comes up to me and says, you weren't funny, or... I don't like the way you dress. Okay, fine. But that's an opinion. That is an observation. You've given me nothing there. That's simply coming from you. It literally washes off of me. But if someone comes up to me and says, hey, Ryan, I don't really like the way that you dress because your shirt is untucked and it was really distracting. If you tucked in your shirt when you talked on stage, it's going to make you perceive more uh, professional and it's going to be less distracting. Boom. Brilliant feedback. I love it. There's a how. Tuck it in. There's a why. It's not distracting. I can be more perceived as more professional. So, by the way, feedback that I have received. Um, so, so uh, I, it's like a huge eye opener of it can instantly help you feel good to go, that was an opinion. Nope. Or that was feedback. And I will tell you, though. Be, I will listen to 100% of the feedback. That does not mean I implement 100% of the feedback either, right? Um, there are people who have given me feedback to tell me about taking off my glasses because the reflection and because the, I don't want to wear contacts. It's not for me. I tried it. I like my glasses, so I'm okay with wearing glasses. Um, so I'm not saying implement 100% of the feedback. I'm saying listen to the feedback. Interesting. I like that distinction quite a bit. Um, yeah, it's going to huh? because I do still, I'm, as I said, I'm very sensitive to negative opinions, not negative feedback. That's really good, you know, shift and thinking that you just gave me. I love it. It's, it's, it's changed my life. Like people say a lot of negative crappy things about me opinion wise, but I don't soak it up anymore. 
Great. It's I used to be the sponge and now I'm a, a brick wall. Like it's <laughs> yeah, for real on that. Yeah. Really to that. Interesting. Um, and it's also reassuring to know mm -hmm. that you were that way too <laughs> so yeah. i know i can i too can become a brick wall because anybody can become the i can be the brick wall <laughs> the, the, the brickiest yeah, um, you, you've also said that becoming a public a better public speaker um makes you what well, makes one um well a better sales leader i can see that but you also said just um a better leader and i know that a lot of leaders um, especially the ones that suppose that are more introverted, um, struggle with public speaking. So do you think it's essential and if so to be the leader? Because mm -hmm. anybody so can be a I think I know. Um, there are two things that I am confident on, uh, in the sense of what I'm about to say. And it it creates a little um it creates some opinions. <laughs> and I'm okay with that. Um here how you communicate is how you operate, period. You have crappy communication as a leader, your operations are gonna be crappy. You have strong communications as a leader, you're gonna have strong team work. I mean, everything comes down to ultimately a branch of communication. Here's the other thing. Every problem you have is communication-based, period. Every problem. And we can argue, we can talk about, name me a problem that's not communication-based. I haven't been able to find one. So when you are able to figure out how to communicate more effectively, you're going to solve more problems. You're going to be more creative. You're going to be leading more people into a direction of productivity or profitability. And then when you see yourself as the leader and you know that the way that I communicate is going to determine or dictate how my company or team operates, then I need to be the best at what I do. That's why communication is important. And I agree with you. Yeah, I've seen examples of that so many times. Um, that's that's really interesting. Um, so many other questions for you, but I, I want to um, ask one of the questions that our, our audience asked so that um, I, I'm also including them because I have a lot of my own. I don't want to be completely selfish. Um, but you know what? Just one last one on what you said right now. <laughs> when you're talking, I'm selfish. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just going to own who I am. But when you were talking about, um, actually, I'm going to just ask you about yourself. So you're obviously a fantastic communicator um, and you're just very eloquent and you have so many interesting things to say. Are you also an excellent listener? Am I an excellent listener? It depends if you ask my wife or not. Are um, you the listener or are you a listener? If you ask my wife or not, she's going to say no. Um, let's see. Am I an excellent listener? Um, I'm probably not. Um, I probably am when, this might sound really bad, I am a really good listener when I want to be. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, that sounds bad. Like when I want to learn and when I want to soak up and when I want to like research, I listen and I, and listening is more than other things. Like, um, you might, the other, um, my business is pivoting and it's more online. And like the other day, I, I'm yesterday, I'm talking to a speaker and he says these three words that because I'm trying to figure out how I need to pivot my business. And he says, you know, something along the lines of all I hear are relevant, timely, adaptable. That's what this group is looking for. So in my in my outline for the request for proposal, I use those words, relatable, timely, adaptable, because I heard those because I know I needed to put those in there. So I would say, yes, I'm a good listener in that regards. Um, but there are times when like, I'm not, and that's bad. I'm also, there are times when I'm not the best communicator because I'm learning and I'm figuring things out and I'm constantly in positions where I go, oh, that was not what I wanted to do. I And you know, I, I come back to it and think about how I can do it better next time. So although I do know a lot about communication, there's still a lot that I have to learn and implement in practice. Like I am not the one to, I you, you maybe can talk to like two people in the world who have ever seen me like yell or get mad. Like I don't do that. I don't get angry. I don't really get mad. It's, it's not in my wheelhouse. But the other day I snapped at my kid because it was just so frustrating. I was like so frustrated with her and slamming and putting things on. And I was like, stop. 
you know? And I was like, oh crap, I like, I don't want her to see me communicate that way. And I, but I learned a good lesson from it of like, okay, cool. Here's how I escalated. Well, this is where I yelled. Here's where I escalated. Okay, what can I do now to minimize that even escalation? So there's lessons in it. Um, there's embarrassed, like I even, I feel I, I'm cringing even telling you that I did that. Um, but yeah, I would say that I'm, I'm constantly learning to be a better listener and a better communicator. Brian, I love that you see everything as a lesson and the learning opportunity and, you know, writing things down. I definitely, like, I know that that is what separates the A's from the V's. It's just this constant obsession with learning and understanding and growth. I just... That's my job. I, yeah. yeah it's just, know, like, that's what people say, too. Like, whenever... There there have been people who... Uh, and my last example... Um, and it kind of relates to um, your talk. Uh, or the talk that you heard at, um, at the Global Leadership Conference in Frankfurt. Like, there'll be times when people are... So upset. when I travel, there's guaranteed time that things are going to happen with travel. Plants are going to be canceled or things are going to happen or all this stuff's going to go on. And I'm at this uh, this um, time when the hotel is overbooked. They don't have a room for me. You know, I have a reservation. Um, there's like 30 people just like up at the counter because I'm at this other in this other country. And one of the guys goes like, how are you so calm right now? And for me, I wasn't seeing it as calm. All I see is speech material. So for me, I'm like, oh, okay, that person is doing that. That person is doing that. that person got something because they said that. So for everything we do now, it's all speech material. So that's how I look at it. It's like my life is speech material. Your life is speech material. I, I, I have the same for me. My life is LinkedIn content material. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. it's starting to get, you know, I'm, I'm starting to question whether, you know, that's also a healthy thing because very often, like, and something bad's going to be happening. I'm gonna, that's going to make for a good post. So I relate to that. Yeah. Um, okay, no, I'm going to start. I'm going to ask. We have very little time. So I'm going to ask questions from the audience because I had another follow up from, from myself. So another question. Is there a massive difference delivering to local audiences and international ones? Um, do you navigate cultural elements, take them into account, or do you just stay fully authentic and it doesn't kind of matter geographically where you're delivering your keynote at? Here's the best example that I can give. Okay, so let's say you invite me to a, a sporting event. And it can be any, do you like sports? Some. Do you like sports? Okay, so let's say you invite me to a, a football game, okay? And I don't really like football. I don't really know much about football, but you invite me to a football game, and we go, and it's fun. And I'm like, yeah, cool, because we're drinking, and we're having a good time, and we're drinking beer. And I'm like, okay, we'll drink beer. That's cool. Like, we're having a good time. And we're high-fiving, and we're yelling, and it's crazy. And then the next week, you're like, hey, uh, you and a friend, your friend from out of the country or someone, they, they want to go to an art gallery. We go to that art gallery. I don't really know much about art, but I'm going to dress a little differently. I'm going to have a martini instead of a beer. I'm going to talk a lot softer inside of the art gallery. If you confuse those two, if I came to the football game and I had my martini shaker and I was like, ha, 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 and I like whispered, you'd be like, who's this guy? I hate this guy. If I went to the art gallery and I was like, this art rocks, yeah, you would say, like, oh my God, I hate this guy, right? So I'm not changing who I am, but I am changing how I do it based off of what environment I'm in. So I'm not changing who I am when I go and talk in China or Australia or Egypt. I am changing my delivery when I go and make chalk in China and Australia and Egypt by far. Very different cultures. Love the metaphor. That was a very good metaphor, by the way. I don't know if that was cursed or just came out, but that was really good. Um, another sure. question from the audience, and I relate to this. You know, my biggest pediment, biggest area that I could focus on improving <laughs> is my right. physical reaction, right? So I love speaking in public. I love being on the stage. I love connecting with people, and I believe in my message and emotion, and I'm prepared. I love all about it. But 
my sometimes my just physical reactions just create that barrier i get anxious and one of our audience members says she gets heart palpitations so it's just it's hard to get in the groove when you're just like <gasps> the heart is racing the palms are sweating and just like just the physiology takes over yeah. um, do you have anything to recommend there on how that can be tackled yeah there's a really good book um i think i have it on my shelf confessions of a public speaker let's see um so this is a uh, confessions of a public speaker the book uh, which I, I highly recommend it's by uh, scott birkin and what he does and he has a really good chapter in this book that he explains and talks about how public speaking what it is is actually a biological response of the reasons why you feel that because as we were evolving as a species whenever we had eyes on us that we were unfamiliar with and we were put in a position that we felt like we couldn't protect ourselves like a stage where we couldn't run away or we weren't protected that it sent a signal to our body to flee that's why your heart pumps so fast is because it pumps more blood to your extremities because you're about to run that's why you sweat is because you're going to run. You need the lubricant to, to run. Um, that's why you're taking in deeper breaths is to put oxygen in your body. So it's this biological response. It's not a like it's not a, a mental response. So ultimately, as a species, that hasn't caught up to us, but we now have a brain to say, no one in this audience is gonna kill me. Um, <laughs> no one is gonna throw a spear at my heart. Um, here's, here, here are two things that I do to minimize that. I go and I talk to as many people as I can beforehand in that audience. So there'll be speakers who they'll stay in their green room and they'll hang out. You will see me in the audience. I'm shaking hands. I'm like saying, hi, I'm, I'm learning your name. And the reason why is so then when I go on stage, I'm talking to people I already know. So my heart isn't fast, I'm not sweating. I know you, I know your name is Kathy or Bill or Stephanie, like I know you. Um, that's, that's a really big one that I do. And then I remind myself, hey, your heart is beating really fast because this is biological. No one's gonna kill you, no one's gonna do anything to you. And then here's the biggest one as well. I always remind myself they want to be here. Like, they're not, they're not here to be like, yeah, let's see Ryan Avery fail. Like they're like, hey, Ryan Avery's here. He's strategies on communication leadership. I want to learn some strategies. And I'm like, I have those strategies. I want to give them to you. So learning and talking about those things has been really helpful for me. Cool. You you don't understand. I'm taking zero notes, but I'm re-watching this and taking <laughs> so many notes. So I'm understanding now also why. And it goes to what you said at the beginning. I'm understanding now why, you know, you were highly sought after um, trainer, public speaker, teacher, whatever you want to call. Um, because it really is that. It's not just about the fact that you're extremely eloquent and you have a great presence and charisma, which you do. Um, but it's just all really precise, pointed information you're giving. And that's amazing. And just like, I'm cluttered. You just go like, boom, story, metaphor, takeaway. Boom, story, <laughs> takeaway, which is awesome. Um, I'll ask you one more question um, from the audience. So in your opinion, what do you think, what are the elements of a talk um, that make a talk amazing? So I know you said storytelling. I know you also said being, um, just living that story, like really in the presence, agree with you. But also what about, you know, a lot of, I've read a lot of advice and I suppose this is what our um, audience member is referring to. What about repetition? You know, there's this advice of like, you repeat the same thing three times. Is it a punchy title, punchy opening line, punchy last line? Like what are some of the quick tips there? Quick tips are, um, one thing that I learned from my mentor is you should, speak or you should teach how you like to be taught so for me i like here's a strategy move on here's a tangible strategy move on so that's all my style because that's how i like that there are some people who like i all there are some people who love uh, a gary vaynerchuk type right because he's like raw and he's authentic and he cusses and he's like bam here's my story because that's probably how he likes to learn is like raw, authentic, like real, like I'm cussing at a bar. I, I would never do that because that's not me. So the first thing is like, identify how do you like to learn? 
Are you this conceptual, like you love to tell a big story and then ultimately give one thing at the end? Well, then do it that way because then you'll attract those type of people. Um, so I like to learn fast strategies on, on that way. Um, for me, uh, and this is solely debatable, um, my title is my message. I don't want to surprise you on what my message is. There are some speakers who go, ooh, and then I want to, and then I want to shock them. Like, the reveal, yeah. like, no, no, I don't want to surprise you. I want you to know, here's my message. And here is the who, what, when, where, how, and why that message is important. So make, and your message doesn't have to be creative. Um, for me, it has to be authentic and relevant. Um, so like an, a big um, webinar or virtual trainings that I've been doing for a lot of companies is how to motivate your team while you feel like the world is ending. And that's what I'm doing is I'm showing them how to motivate their team while the world is ending because that's language that I got from people um, from in, in you got her coming in. Tell her come in. Hey. How are you? How are you doing? It's my son. He decided okay. to make an appearance. All right. Okay. Son, I have two. You can say hi. Um, there you go. Oh, look at that. And I was not going to let him come in. I love you. That's awesome. That was so cool. um, I'll end with one last question. Okay. Even though, as you can imagine, I have about a hundred more but i wanted today's conversation to yes be tangible but i already said that i just want messages of positivity and hope and inspiration because we're seeing so much negativity these days and it's just becoming overwhelming so i know one of the things that you've said is if you want to succeed don't surround yourself with people who will challenge your big dreams mm -hmm. just talk a bit about that as a closure yeah, so I'm a big fan of, uh, I learned this, I'm, I'm breaking an, a world record out in Antarctica and um, um, I'm with my wife and we're like figuring out why we're there. And we ultimately realized like, it's not about hanging out with people who challenge your big dreams. It's about hanging out with people who challenge you to dream bigger. And that's a really important thing to be around. And I will tell you, personal experience and those that I've interacted with, a lot of the times it can come from a family member and it feels like we need to be loyal to that family member, but to minimize your interaction with people like those who challenge them are very important. And it's your decision. Ultimately going back to that, like, are you thinking about doing it or are you doing something about it? That differentiates a leader versus the leader. A leader thinks about it. The leader does something about it. So one, my last thought for you from today's conversation is who is one person you need to stop hanging out with. And one person you need to start hanging out with. That's as that is as important as letting someone go. It's as important as reaching out or connecting or figuring out who I need to hang out with, who says, Hey, you don't need to do five speeches a year, you need to do 10. Or or I hear you. Your your thing is you want to do fun because you want to be around your family. Well, I want you to make X amount more, or I want you to do more. I want you to challenge your not challenge your big dreams. I want you to challenge to dream bigger. I love that. That's really awesome. That just gave me shivers. I have to tell you, this was an absolute highlight of a conversation for me. You know, I thought it would be good to have it on Friday as to wrap up the week. I know we wish we'd had it on Monday because I'd be like, oh, okay. And you, got flowers. and you got flowers from your son. Like, how oh, cool. <laughs> no, that was that was special. I'm going to, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to listen to this first thing on Monday morning. So now I'm just going to go like, wow, I'm ready to dream and go. Thank you so much, Ryan. It has been an absolute pleasure to, to be speaking with you today. And I know you've inspired a lot of people listening. Thanks, y'all.